Okay, so so far we discussed about guidance systems, and today we are going to start thinking about or talking about control systems. So we have looked at what is the so-called desired path which our vehicle wants to follow, but we will now focus our attention on how to make our actuators work so that our craft actually follows the desired path. So we want to now affect the change through our actuators so that we can actually follow the desired path which our guidance system has laid out for us. Okay, so here when we are looking at the craft's equations of motion and we have seen this before that these equations are not linear necessarily. They may be non-linear and sometimes they may have a strong coupling with each other. And we have to deal with that system and still make sure that our control system works fine. Typically, we will first investigate the so-called linear systems, which are much easier to deal with. And when the motions are not relatively too strong, okay, when we are not asking to be following very sharp curvature paths or very distinct uh, changes in the orientation suddenly, we can get away with linear methods more or less. So in that, one of the key features is that we want to use successive loop closure. Okay. Successive loop closure. So instead of devising a single feedback loop, which will try to stabilize our system, we might want to loop, close multiple loops around our system so that uh, we can achieve the same dynamics which we want, but with relatively simpler control laws. So rather than one control law, which may be presumably more complicated, we want to look at multitude of uh, control laws, which may be uh, much simpler in nature. This will become a little clear as we start seeing what seeing it in action as to what it is going on. Okay. Again, in this, we are assuming that the certain modes can be controlled using a linear model. So we are sticking to the linear model for now, but you will see later that we will relax this condition and we'll look at nonlinear plan, which is controlled still by PID. And we'll use Lyapunov methods to demonstrate that actually stability can be guaranteed. Okay, so we'll extend into that, but to begin with, we'll start off with the linear systems. We treat these couplings and unmodeled dynamics as disturbances. So uh, any coupling between the modes and anything which we are not modeling very precisely, something like environmental disturbances, if they're not captured exactly, so whatever is the difference between what I captured versus what the real craft experiences would be considered as this unmodeled dynamics. And all of that we are lumping together as disturbances that can be compensated using an integral action in our controller. So typically we want to say that the integral action will take care of any things which I may not have captured accurately in my modeling process. I'll take care of them using my integral law. So we'll look first, as I said, at successive loop closure designs and we'll particularly focus on two particular problems. One is the heading autopilot design and path following control. So probably we'll be covering both of these to a certain extent today. Probably we may not cover the path following. We may not be able to complete it today. We'll try to pick it up in the next class, okay? Which will be on Wednesday, okay? Okay. So these, the idea here is that these four feedback loops which we are trying to close around the open loop system will be designed using what are called, called pole placement algorithms. And some of you who took my linear course on maneuvering or the undergraduate course on maneuvering are probably aware about this idea as to what I mean by this pole placement algorithm. The idea is that we want to take a look at what the transfer function of the system is of the closed loop system and then tune our gains so that that the poles of the system actually lie in the left half plane in the S plane. So as long as the poles are lying somewhere here, you will see that the system is stable because it has negative real marks. 
Okay. As I said again, the idea is to here see if we can close several simple feedback loops in su succession around the open loop plant dynamics rather than a single control system, which may be presumably more complicated. This part of it may not make so, so much sense just as yet until we start seeing an example of that being done. And that example will be mostly based on the path following methodology. So when we see that happen, you will appreciate what is going on. Okay, let's give the premise of the problem. So we will assume here that our plant, which is called P of S, let us say, can be described as a con conjugation of P1 of S and P2 of S. Okay, so in fact, it is the other way around. P2 of S applied to the output of P1 of S. Okay. And we are looking at this combined plant dynamics on which we want to apply our controller and we are trying to close two loops here as you can see. So this is the first loop and this outside one is the second loop that I am trying to close. <coughs> the output of our plant is assumed to be Y2. And the input to this P2 system is assumed to be U2. And the output of this plant system P1 is assumed to be Y1. So therefore Y1 is equal to U2. Okay. Then we have the input of the plant system, which we call as U1. That's what you see here. And then the controller is basically taking an error between the output of plant one so I'll call this one plant one, I'll call this one plant two. So output of plant one and the reference value which is being provided for R1. So if R1 is the reference value and Y1 is the output, I take the difference between them and I get E1. So E1 is basically R1 minus Y1. That difference is fed into the C1 controller and it generates the input value U1, which then drives the plant so that basically the output of the plant Y1 starts tracking whatever is the value we provided in R1. Okay, that is the basic idea behind it, feedback loop. Now, in the cascade of the things, once if this loop is complete and is operational properly, you'll see that whatever R1 is coming, is what Y1 we should be getting technically if everything is going correctly, right? And now we can step back and take a look at what is happening in the outer system and try to control that outer system properly using a feedback loop again, where we are taking out Y2 as the output, taking the difference between the reference value R2 to get an error signal E2, which is R2 minus Y2, and the controller tries to generate the so-called reference value R1. Okay, And that R1 is what Y1 will track, so that Y1 is what we will feed to plant P2, and therefore that output Y2 eventually should start tracking whatever R2 I give. So notice here I am kind of taking the big problem. The main problem, the end goal of the problem is I want my output of the plant to track R2. That is what I want to do. Okay, But instead of going about a single feedback loop, I am trying to go about it by two multiple feedback loops in this particular case. That is why the loop closure in successive loop closure. Okay, I am closing the first loop first and then successively I am closing the second loop. Is everybody with me so far? Yes, Krishna Vilu. What is the benefits we are using the successive loop closure? The successive loop closing will help me with uh, making my controller easier to design rather than a single loop closure, which may possibly be more complex. The control law may be looking more complex. So I'm rather trying to say that I loop close successively so that my control law is looking more reasonable for me to understand what is going on. 
you will get to see this once you see an example that will be much more clear yeah there was another question yes uh, sir uh, in our case what will this p1 and p2 physically mean the plants ah, correct so it, it could as as well be like let us say that you want to control heading first and then you want to control the position of the graph next so you may you may think of your complete orientation vector as x y and psi that you want to actually control then i want to close the loop for psi first and then want to close the loop for position so i want the heading to be matching first to whatever heading value i want to match and eventually i want to match the position as a by product of it okay it, it need not be exactly like that suppose you are looking at an underwater vehicle then i may actually start thinking about pitch as the value which i want to control first and then based on which i want to look at what is the depth of the vehicle let's say if it is being driven by a point engine right so although we we are going to restrict our analysis in this course mostly to surface vehicles but please understand the same methodology is equally extend to underwater vehicles also yes okay. all right so in that sense let's try to get the mathematics of this block diagram into mathematics so rather than having a visual representation let's try to get a mathematical representation of it and so our total plant p is nothing but p1 times p2 or actually this should be technically be p2 of s times p1 of s that's how it should be written but since it's a linear system this commutation actually holds in many of the cases so i don't have to worry about it but for accurate representation i should write it as p2 of s times p1 of s because output of p1 goes into p2 in order to give me the final plant output okay now y2 which is p2 of s applied to the input u2 is now what i am considering so i am just considering this block right here okay and i know this u2 is equal to y1 which is the output from my p1 block so these two are equal so y1 is given by p1 of s applied to u1 and u1 is the input which my controller gives out in order to control the first loop so if the inner control law is chosen as u1 is equal to c1 of s times e1 so i'm choosing u1 is equal to c1 of s times e1 where e1 is the difference between r1 and y1 so e1 is r1 minus y1 being fed into c1 of s gives me u1 okay i'm just basically decoding that block diagram into mathematics that's all i'm not doing anything else as of now okay now once i have u1 specified i can write down that so called transfer function between y1 and r1 okay so y1 is p1 times u1 u1 is c1 times e1 so if i wanted to write that down y1 will become p1 of s times c1 of s times e1 which is r1 minus y1 correct i can rearrange the terms here in order to get all the terms which are depending on y1 to one side so then i'll get y1 times 1 plus e1 of s c1 of s is equal to p1 of s c1 of s times r1 correct now if i take the input by output sorry output by input i'll get this relationship y1 by r1 is given by p1 of s c1 of s divided by 1 plus p1 of s c1 of s everybody with me so far yes no shadav you with me 
Can you repeat it once again? I just am not getting. See, I have y1 is p1 of s times u1, correct? Yes, sir. y1 is p1 of s times u1. Yes. u1 is c1 of s times e1. So therefore, I can write y1 is p1 times c1 times e1. I can write it like that, correct? Mm. So that is what I'm doing here. p1 times c1 times e1, but e1 is nothing but the difference between r1 and y1. Correct? Now I have just rearranging all the terms of y to one side. So I'm getting y1 times 1 plus p1 times c1. So that p1 times c1 times y1, I'm taking it to the left hand side. Okay. What I'm left on the right hand side will be p1 times c1 times r1. So if I want to calculate now y1 by r1, it will simply be this value p1 c1 divided by 1 plus p1 c1. Okay, now just see if the value of C1 is really, really large. Okay, and given that the value of the plant is kind of fixed at certain time, certain value, as C1 of S becomes larger and larger, what will happen to this fraction? This fraction will tend to 1, right, approximately as my C1 of S becomes larger and larger. So assuming that C1 has S is large enough, okay, and we can guarantee that Y1 will actually start striking R1. If for a range of values of S, or for a range of values of frequency of interest to me, I ensure that C1 of S actually has a very large value, I can make sure that y1 now basically starts tracking r1. Is everybody with me so far? Krishna Velu? Yes, got it? Okay. All right. So we will assume that this uh, c1 of s, when I start plotting it in the frequency domain, let us say, C1 of i omega. So I'm basically looking in the frequency domain, let's say, and let's say I'm looking mostly in the absolute value of it. I want this value to be really large and fairly constant across the range of frequencies of interest to me. Okay. But I can't hold it at that. At some point, I'll have to let it go and then it will basically come down. And we discussed this idea that the bandwidth basically refers to the portion at which it is having a sufficiently high value, right? So the bandwidth of this system can approximately be given by this value right here. Okay. And I call that bandwidth in this case as omega one for that inside loop dynamics, okay? For the dynamics which is trying to map y y1 equal to r1, the bandwidth is, let us say, omega 1. All right. We'll see why this bandwidth is important in just a minute. Now, once I have guaranteed that this inner loop is matching up, it's as if my system has become simpler, right? As if this entire block has vanished as if it has just become one point, right? As long as Y1 is tracking R1, I really don't need to bother about what is happening inside of it. Everybody with me? If I, if I design the controller properly, Y1 should be equal to R1 for all the range of frequencies of interest to me. Now, once it is the case, my system has kind of reduced. So what does my new system look like? It looks like E2 gives out an output, 
there is a C2 which gives out an output and that is taking a feedback signal from here and giving as value R2. And there is a negative feedback here, positive feedback here, I get E2 and that is giving out, the controller is basically giving out the values which I need. So the controller is giving out R1 and that R1 is as if being directly fed into P2. gives out an R1 and that is equal to Y1 which is being fed into P2. That's what is happening. Now if I wanted to write down the dynamics for this system between Y2 and R2, okay, why don't you guys go ahead and tell me what will be the transfer function between Y2 by R2. It'll be the same, right? Like uh, as previously, C two P two divided by one plus C two. Yes, it should have the same form as before because it looks exactly like that what which was there before. The only thing is, it will be P two C two of S divided by one plus P two of S times C two of S. Right? That is what we should get out of it. Now notice here that when I am doing this outer loop control, I am really not bothered about what is happening in the inside loop dynamics. I am assuming that the inside loop dynamics is doing its thing and magically it is doing the tracking there. And I am simply using that concept that yes, the output of the controller is actually exactly equal to what I want to feed to my plant P. Okay. But that comes at a cost and that is where this bandwidth discussion becomes important. And I'll come to that in just a minute. Okay. Before I come to that though, in order to ensure that this tracking law for the outer loop can be designed independent of the inner loop, I have to make sure that the bandwidth of the inner loop okay, is much, much bigger than the outer loop, which means that the inner loop should be doing its tracking for more frequencies than what the outer loop is doing its track tracking for, right? Only then I can ensure actually that this property can be used. If I don't do that, if it is the other way around, then what will happen? The tracking will not ensure and the outer controller may become unstable. Is everybody following me? Yes. Krishna Velu, you are speaking something, but I can't hear you. You are muted, I think. I am not speaking, sir. Just a replay. Sir, can you please repeat that last one? Sorry, can I? Repeat, sir. Ah, can I repeat? Yeah, sure. No problem. See, the idea is, let's go back to this picture. Now, if I want to plot mod of C2 of I omega, okay, basically I want to look at what is happening with the, uh, actually this is not uh, C1, this is, I should call it L1. Okay. This is the closed loop dynamics of the system that I'm interested in, at what frequencies that is valid. So let us say that the closed loop dynamics of <clears throat> The inside loop looks like this, okay? And if the closed loop dynamics of the outside loop, I'm going to draw that with, let's say, a green, uh, blue ink, looks somewhat like this, okay? And let's say that this distance is omega 2. Okay. Let's say the omega 2 bandwidth is bigger than the bandwidth of omega 1. Which means that when I am operating my system at any of 
these frequencies. So let's say at this frequency I'm operating. Okay. Then what has happened? The outer loop controller is assuming that a perfect tracking is happening on the inner loop controller. We assume that when we said that these two lines, all of whatever is in here can be disregarded. They're doing a perfect tracking is what we assume. But in reality, is it happening? It's not happening because we are outside the bandwidth of the black line. Right? So it is not ensuring that a proper tracking is happening inside the thing. This may lead to possible errors in the tracking of, of the outside loop also. So outside loop, what it is assuming that the dynamics will be in certain manner need not necessarily be in that manner. So it may be unstable. So a better way to do it is to make sure that omega 2 is always smaller than omega 1. Okay, when in that case what will happen, and I'm going to draw that new omega 2 with a green line. Let's say this is my new omega 2. With this new omega 2, no matter at what outer loop frequencies of interest that I want to do the tracking, the inner loop tracking is always working fine. Right? So my dynamics is precisely known that it will work fine in this case. I'm guaranteed to see that the process should work perfectly. Is that making sense? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So in order to have that stability, there should be a sufficient bandwidth separation between the inner and the outer feedback loops. A typical choice would be that you want to make your outer bandwidth loop, uh, outer loops bandwidth to be some fraction of the inner loops bandwidth. And a typical good value of this W to be chosen will be somewhere between five and 10. Okay, that's the kind of the rule of thumb which you can use for your tracking purposes. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, now let's take a look at how do I make sure that my desired dynamics are actually guaranteed. So I want to look at a pole placement algorithm in the sense that what should be my controller gains so that I can have a system poles at a desired location on the S plane. That is the idea. What should be my controller gains here for the proportional derivative and integral gains so that my system has poles or transfer function system has poles at prescribed locations in the S plane. Okay, so here we'll consider a second order system which is being supplied by a proportional derivative control. So our planned dynamics is a second order system, okay, followed by a control law, which is looking at a PD control on it. So if I were to look at what is the differential equation, which is governing the system, it is Y double dot plus A1 times Y dot plus A naught times Y is equal to B naught times U. This is the differential equation which is governing the output of the system for a given input u. Okay, We took a Laplace transform of it and that is why we are seeing this as the transfer function come out of it. Now we are saying that u will be provided as minus kp times the error where error is the difference between y and y desired. It might be a mistake here. Oh no, it's fine. Yeah, this is fine. Correct. Yeah, so I have this error as y minus the y desired value, and that is being fed into your proportional part of the controller. And then I have the derivative part of the controller, which is depending on y dot. Okay, 
this feedback loop I'm giving to the system, and then I want to observe where the poles should be placed. Basically, what I can change is KP and KD. And what I want to make a change is the closed loop system's poles should be located at a certain point of interest to me. <coughs> okay, so it is easy. Actually, why don't you guys go ahead and try to find out the closed loop system's transfer function in this particular case. Which means that I want to look at transfer function between y and y desired. Sir, so that uh, control law that has been written, uh, hmm. kd into y dot. Correct. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. It's correct. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was also checking out, whether the sign is correct. Yes, it is correct. Yes. Um, um, uh, sorry, sir, I, I kind of forgot to question. What is the question here? Like the question, question is, find the closed loop transfer function between y and y desired. Okay. Uh, sir, also, it should be ey dot. Well, yeah, yd dot is not changing. Yeah, and here I'm assuming, well, love that yd is not changing with time. Then I can simply call it as yd dot. So yd dot is zero. So I'm looking at a set point regulation, but yes, if it's a tracking problem, you're right. Yd dot would not be zero. And then the derivative part would be actually multiplied by E, you know, what you call it, the derivative of Ey. Anybody? What do we have?
sir it's again in the similar fashion like uh, y of s upon y d of s is p of s into c of s upon 1 plus p of s into c of s so c here is the control what do you say oh control no but i want the precise expression for yeah. y over y d yeah uh, i'm getting b not k p upon s square plus uh, in bracket k1 plus b not k d times s plus a not plus b not k p uh, tell me again of the denominator s square times uh, instead of the k1 i am getting a1 plus b not k d mm -hmm. and instead of a not uh, a not plus b not k p plus a not plus b not k p This is what you're getting, am I right? Yes. Okay, perfect. That's quite right, actually. That is what you should get out. So you should get b naught times k t divided by s square plus a one plus b naught k d times s plus a naught plus b naught k t. Now, we want to when we are trying to design the controller, it is very easy for us to say that okay the control input can be as large as we want but in reality is what happens is that we can't choose our controller gains to be extremely large yes putting a large value on the controller gains can seem like an excellent thing to do in the simulations where you get excellent tracking but when you try to do the implementation on the practical systems you start to realize that the the things don't go your way or there is a saturation effect which comes into the picture. So in order to avoid that effect, when we are doing this linear design, what we would typically do is we'll try to typically fix out the maximum amplitude of this control value u. Okay, And we'll assume that this control value u's maximum value for a assumed value of y dot equal to zero. So if u is the u max is the maximum value of the control input which is possible, then I do not want to put my kt value to be bigger than this value, where u max is the maximum value of the control input which is possible for y dot equal to zero, and ey max is a tunable parameter that I can tune with. And what does it represent? EY max basically represents the step error from a step input of a nominal size. So if I give an input, a step input to the system, what is the error which I am getting in the system? That is what I am taking as a tunable parameter. So I can basically play around with this parameter so that my gain value is more or less looking reasonable. Otherwise, I can just choose KP to be any value that I want then I can be in dangerous waters because in reality I may not be able to get the actuation from the thrusters or from the rudder depending on how what I need. That may not be possible. So in order to avoid that during our design phase, we try to reduce or try to identify uh, what is this value of u max and then use this parameter e max in order to tune out our controller gain kp. You may think of this u max as let's say if you're trying to look at a heading control problem delta will be the rudder angle which is the tunable parameter you know that that rudder angle can't be more than 35 degrees for typical ships right so that delta max being 35 degrees is what your u max then becomes and then you are trying to play around with this error max what is the maximum value of this error that you can use with in order to play around with what your KP value should look like. All right. So you can think of these as user inputs, and then you, you're trying to design your system based on these user inputs. Now, let's say that this closed loop system that you found, okay, this closed loop system that you found, you want to ensure that its poles are at, at a particular location, then I can think of this system as a second order system and try to equate its poles to the poles of a second order spring mass damper system. Okay. A spring mass damper system would have a transfer function which looks like omega n square divided by s square plus 2 zeta omega n s 
plus omega n square, right? And I'll try to equate that transfer function with this transfer function and make a comparison to figure out what to do with these, where to put my poles. And the easiest way to look at is what is happening to the denominator and try to then equate the denominators together. And whatever is the constant which is left on the numerator will only be a scaling factor. So therefore that doesn't bother us as much. It's the location of the poles which really determines the stability. So we can do the equation between the coefficients of S and the constant term. And you'll see that we'll be able to get an expression for omega n and ke. Okay, so why not we do this? So we have our value a naught plus b naught times kp is equal to omega n square. So a naught plus b naught times kp, but, but kp is written as u max divided by e y max. And that is what is giving you this expression. Everybody with me so far? Similarly, I can equate the coefficients for the uh, what you call the coefficient of s and I'll see that my kd can be specified in this terms. Okay, so now if I want to place a system at a certain pole location, let us say that I gave you the s plane and I say, hey, I want my pole here, a plus id. How would I go about setting my poles there? given the fact that I know what is the second order system's poles, how will I know, how will I put my pole exactly at that location? How can I put my pole exactly in that location? Okay, since this is a complex pole, there will be a conjugate as well. A minus I B. Okay, so how do I find that particular location and place my pole there? What value of Kp and Kd should I choose? Let me make this problem a little easier. I will call this minus A and minus A here. So that A is greater than 0 and B is greater than 0. Assuming that I give you A and B, how will you choose KP and KD? Rather than find a mathematical expression, I want you to think of the process. If you just tell me the process, that is good enough. Uh, so then we want the this the equation that we have currently. Uh, we want the sum of roots and uh, product of roots that we will uh, use to uh, like uh, we know the a and b. So, we know the A and B, okay, correct. Uh, we just have to equate this to the denominator of the previous equation and uh, you mean the equation. Uh, this, this uh, here we uh, we can write these in terms of KP and KD. Yeah, we have already done that, right? We have already got KP and KD in terms of this we have got. We know this will be the value of KP. And then I substitute in, I should get omega n. And I know the value of kd for a given damping ratio and omega n. Now the question is, how do I find zeta and zeta and omega n given a value of a and b? See, at the end of the day, I want my pole to be at 
minus a plus ib and minus a minus ib that is what i want my poles to be correct so i want to make sure that the second order system which i took spring mass damper system to which i equated and then found the expressions for kp and kd they should now be expressed in terms of a and b correct the simple idea here is i just look at where are the poles of this system this system has poles at minus theta omega n plus minus i times omega n times 1 minus theta square that will be the two roots which you will get by solving this quadratic equation right here assuming that theta is less than of course so that means that is the location of those poles that location of the pole must be equal to minus a plus minus ib so which means a is zeta omega n and b is omega n times square root of 1 minus zeta square i know omega n because i fixed my kp value based on the saturation levels so therefore omega n is known to me now i need to find zeta n basically i have to find the damping ratio and once i have the damping ratio i can find the derivative gain corresponding to it by plugging it here sir uh, how do we know this omega n we know this omega n because we fixed the value of kp already based on saturation limits based on what is the maximum control input we can get we tune this value right technically you can still vary omega n don't get me wrong you are right in that sense that omega n can still be variable depending on what is this ey max you can actually vary omega n okay so the process will go something like this once you are given a and b where is my h yeah once i know what are a and b i need to find out what are omega n and zeta which will give me the correct values of a and b once i find zeta and omega n basically from zeta and omega n i can find the value of kd okay and similarly i can actually tune this value so that this omega n actually is now matched so that will that will fix a value for my ey max and essentially that will in turn fix a value for my kp okay so my greens will be fixed based on where my poles will be located want me to go through this one more time uh, yes sir yes okay all right then let's do it tell me then don't don't hesitate you have to ask questions okay we know where a and the poles are right once i know a and b i'm using basically these equations right here to solve for zeta and omega n correct yes okay once i know what what are those zeta and omega n i can plug them into here to get my kd value correct yes and my kp value is nothing but it is uh, what you call omega n square minus a not by b not this is what it should be right because omega n square is equal to a not plus b not kp yeah yes so i rearrange so kp will become omega n square minus a not by b not okay i know what my omega n value is so therefore i can fix my kp value yes kp is given in terms of u max by y e max so i can fix a value on what will be this y e max although that is not really important once you know kp you are basically your control is fixed yes okay so given a point where i want to place the pole 
now you know how to go back and calculate my gains of the controller so that my poles will be at that location where I intend them to be. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. That is all we are saying in this particular case. Okay. That is what we are looking at. We'll do one thing. We'll stop here for now. And in the next class, we'll look at the application of this method, which we just discussed, to a heading controller problem. And that will clear things up much more. So where we'll try to take a look at a Nomoto model, and we'll try to apply this problem, this approach to that heading control problem, and then we'll see what's happening. OK? All right, so that will be all for today. Let me are there any questions before I wind down? No questions? Okay, in that case, let me stop recording.